Hello, viewers, and welcome to another episode of Elections by Numbers. Today, we're talking about the Keystone State, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the only state of the original 13 colonies that does not have Atlantic Ocean beachfront. The Crayola factory in Lehigh Valley uh, produces over 3 billion crayons every year. The state is a place of early settlement by uh, German immigrants, which make up much of today's Pennsylvania Dutch communities, which includes the Amish. The state's largest city, Philadelphia, is also home to the world's first computer ever made, uh, introduced to the public in 1946. It was called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, and was used mainly to uh, do calculations for the U.S. Army's ballistics program, and it took up an entire room, as you can see. Today, of course, it has been reduced to this. Moving right along, Pennsylvania has 18 congressional house districts, and the current balance of power is even. It is nine Democrats to nine Republicans. Five of those 18 districts actually flipped uh, two years ago in 2018 during the most recent midterm elections. Four of them flipped in favor of Democrats, and one flipped in favor of Republicans, netting uh, Democrats a gain of three seats at the end of the day. Those elections did occur after a redrawing of the congressional districts uh, that happened in Pennsylvania towards the uh, beginning of 2018 to take care of gerrymandering issues. Um, some of the districts, I mean, I'll put one up here, uh, just looked absolutely crazy. They favored Republicans in a way that was deemed uh, unconstitutional. So the maps were redrawn and Democrats uh, cleaned up pretty well in 2018 as a result. To understand how Pennsylvanians have been voting for their representatives over the last decade, let's pull up a line graph right now. So this line graph really does tell a definite story. Um, at the beginning of the decade, 2010, and even going into 2012, 12, we had razor thin margins in terms of raw numbers uh, turning out from both parties for their House candidates. Very competitive in Pennsylvania towards the beginning of the decade. 2014 was, of course, the year where uh, congressional Republicans really cleaned up. That was a great year for Republicans. And that enthusiasm actually carried into 2016 as well when uh, Donald Trump carried the state. The high turnout for Republicans in 2016 may have been a sort of a preemptive backlash against Hillary Clinton as she was uh, largely expected to win that race. So lots of votes came out for uh, Republican candidates to sort of keep her in check. Of course, that turned out differently than expected. Then of course, here's 2018 coming up hot. Uh, the big blue wave of 2018 where Democrats actually surpassed Republicans in terms of raw numbers pretty easily. And in fact, in one of these remarkable cases uh, that we've seen in a couple other states already, the turnout for uh, Democrats in 2018 exceeded that of Democrats in 2016 for raw House candidates. This explains why they were able to flip four seats versus the uh, Republicans flipping just one two years ago, resulting in the House makeup of Pennsylvania becoming nine to nine. So to recap, beginning of the decade, very competitive. Republicans pull ahead right in the middle, stay ahead into uh, 2016, and then uh, Democrats come back swinging two years later, painting a picture of the present that uh, looks like it might favor Democrats uh, heading into this November as well. Now let's toss that graph aside. We are talking about uh, five districts today specifically. There are five districts in Pennsylvania that I consider to be uh, moderately somewhat competitive this year. And I'm going to list them all in my window here right now, just so you can keep up. They are Pennsylvania's first, seventh, eighth, 10th, and 17th. I've also put next to each district, it's a, it's a lean. It's partisan lean according to the Cook Political Report's partisan voting index uh, when compared to the national average. However, today we are largely going to be ignoring these numbers because they predate the current boundaries of Pennsylvania's House districts. Remember, they were redrawn in early 2018. These values are actually from 2017, so they mean very little uh, to the uh, current political landscape of the state. So we're largely ignoring those. I will leave them up though, just because, you know, it's, it's more information for you. In the place of those values, I will be considering the trajectory of of how uh, the districts have been voting, uh, specifically from 2016 to 2018 after the, the new boundaries had been drawn. Uh, so I'll be keeping that in the back of my mind as we go through these in numerical order. So first we're gonna do Pennsylvania's first district, uh, currently represented by Republican Brian Fitzpatrick. Uh, does he uh, win another term this year, Polbot, or does uh, his Democratic challenger uh, take the helm? And there you have it. We have projected a Republican Brian Fitzpatrick to go on to a third term this year in Pennsylvania's first. Up next, we have Pennsylvania's uh, seventh district, uh, currently represented by Democrat Susan Wilde. Does she go on to another term, Paul Bott? And she does. A Democrat maintaining control of their district uh, in the form of Pennsylvania's seventh this year. Next, we have Pennsylvania's eighth district, also represented by a Democrat, uh, Matthew Cartwright. Uh, does he go on to another term or does his Republican challenger take over? 
All right, and we have projected another Democrat maintaining control of their seat this year. Up next, we have another Republican actually running for re-election in uh, Pennsylvania's 10th district. Uh, Republican Scott Perry is running for another term. How is that likely to go this year, Polbot? Aha, and we have our first flip in Pennsylvania's House. It is in Pennsylvania's 10th district. We have projected that Republican Scott Perry will lose his re-election bid to his Democratic challenger this year. Perry's most recent election was, of course, in the most recent midterm cycle, 2018, where he won by only two and a half percentage points. The trajectory of raw turnout numbers uh, uh, for Democrats versus Republicans in the state uh, as a whole, which suggest, would suggest to me that uh, Perry is in some political trouble this year. And I do think his... Uh, Southern Central Pennsylvania District uh, will uh, vote, will break for the Democrat this year. And lastly, we have one more. We have Pennsylvania's 17th district, currently represented by Democrat Connor Lamb. How is that likely to go, Polbot? And there you have another Democrat maintaining control of their seat in Pennsylvania. So we've gone through all five districts that I consider to be somewhat competitive this year. And we do have one pickup in favor of Democrats, meaning that Democrats will take the majority of seats in Pennsylvania this year after being down uh, what, six to 12 in 2016. So this is a pretty big deal for the legislative makeup of Pennsylvania heading into the future. We've done all our projections for the House for Pennsylvania now. Let's make these uh, results official and put them on our first map right now. Mark it. Now it is time to talk about the presidential election of 2020 starring President Donald Trump and Democratic challenger Joe Biden. Pennsylvania is one of the three Rust Belt states uh, that uh, Donald Trump carried four years ago along with Pennsylvania and Wisconsin that uh, was largely uh, instrumental in him winning the presidency overall over Hillary Clinton. All three were states that were widely expected to go to Hillary Clinton. Uh, so um, Trump's victory in Pennsylvania four years ago was a surprise to many experts and pollsters. Prior to 2016, uh, Pennsylvania had actually not voted for a Republican presidential candidate since 1988 when they broke for George H.W. Bush. The loss of Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin four years ago was the uh, proverbial crumbling of the blue wall, which I would argue never really existed in the first place. But I digress. Let's uh, let's pull up some voter turnout ratios right now to see how Pennsylvanians have been electing their presidents over the past uh, decade. And here we have some values that paint a pretty rosy portrait for uh, Democrats actually heading into the future. We do see uh, both Barack Obama in 2012 and Hillary Clinton in 2016 uh, with a um, with a ratio of over 100%, meaning that they had more enthusiasm relative to their name than the total of Democratic House candidates running in Pennsylvania during those years. Whereas the Republican presidential candidate never cracked 100%, meaning they received fewer votes than the total of all Republican House candidates running in Pennsylvania during both of those years. And the movement from 2012 to 2016 is also in favor of Democrats, moving uh, just over 4% higher for Hillary Clinton than uh, Barack Obama had, and about 3% down for uh, Donald Trump relative to Mitt Romney. Of course, Trump was able to carry the state four years ago, and if that's because if you'll remember from our previous section, uh, 2012 was a very competitive year at the House level for Democrats and Republicans. They turned out in virtually nearly identical numbers. But then in 2016, uh, Republicans really did break away in, the, in terms of those raw numbers, which is how uh, Donald Trump was able to carry the state so narrowly four years ago, so narrowly, despite having a disadvantage of about uh, 15 to 16 percentage points uh, in these uh, ratios that you can see here. So bearing a uh, those numbers in mind and the way that they're trending, let's toss them aside and lastly consider the approval rating of the incumbent. In this case, it is President Trump, and he is at minus 11 points in Pennsylvania right now. Specifically, he has the approval of 43% of Pennsylvanians and the disapproval of 54%, uh, which is not not too good uh, for a state that he won four years ago. This is a pretty similar story uh, to Arizona, which we covered very recently. And with that number, we have everything we need to project how this race could go down in November this year. Let's give all of our numbers to Paul White here to calculate who will carry Pennsylvania in 2020 at the presidential level, President Trump or Joe Biden. And there's your answer. We have projected Joe Biden to carry the Keystone State this year. This would move uh, Pennsylvania back into the Democratic column after it uh, briefly moved into the Republican column four years ago. This margin of victory of 8.78% is uh, better than Barack Obama performed in 2012, though not quite up to his uh, 2008 numbers against uh, John McCain. I credit this result largely with that massive uptick in uh, Democratic enthusiasm going from 2016 to 2018 at the House level. That coupled with Trump's minus 11 point approval rating is certainly not a good look for him in this state moving forward. So now we have uh, another 20 
electoral college votes going to Joe Biden after we've already projected him to win the presidential race uh, last week. Let's make this result official and put it on our presidential map right now. Mark it. So all the election results are in now for the state of Pennsylvania. It's great news for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party as a whole. Let's talk briefly about the future of Pennsylvania by pulling up an old line graph and a new one as well. First, let's take a bit of a closer look at uh, the raw house turnout numbers that we were looking at earlier in the video. And I wanna draw your attention again to those uh, slope values that you can see in both of those equations available there. For Democrats, it's uh, 149.3 and for Republicans, it is 73.1. Basically what those numbers are telling us is that uh, when you look at the last decade, decade as a whole, on average, every two years, Democrats have been turning out more votes for their candidates by a rate of 149,300 votes every two years versus Republicans 73.1, meaning that <laughs> uh, Democrats are break breaking away uh, from Republicans at a rate of nearly two to one when you look at the last decade as a whole. And what's crazy about those numbers is that it's that's all due to Democrats' performance in 2018. Had, had Hillary Clinton won the presidency four years ago, we would be seeing a massive swing to the right in Pennsylvania right now. But large turnout in Pennsylvania for Democrats, I think was largely driven by anti-Trump turnout. It's how they were able to flip four seats uh, versus the Republicans flip of one. And it's the reason why at the end of the decade, they have a higher slope value. It's because, uh, you know, they started off even, Republicans gained, and then Democrats came back in a big way, turning out more votes in 2018 than 2016, which is a big deal. I can't stress that enough. Turning out more votes in a midterm year versus a presidential year is nuts. And looking quickly at this other line graph, this is just another way to visualize those uh, voter turnout ratios that we were looking at earlier. Basically, there's a slight upward slope uh, in Democrats' favor and a slight downward slope working against Republicans, uh, meaning that uh, there was a wider enthusiasm gap relative to House candidates for Hillary Clinton relative to Barack Obama and uh, the opposite for uh, Trump relative to Romney. Trump actually received fewer votes relative to House candidates than Romney did. Of course, 2016 was a much better year for congressional turnout for Republicans, which is why Trump was able to carry the state. At the end of the day, this points to even more to the theory that uh, I think Pennsylvania is uh, not is somewhat displeased with this current president. Certainly not a good look for him going into uh, next month. Well, it's really two weeks from now, huh? So let's toss those graphs aside. Now I'll give you my final consensus on Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is certainly not part of any blue wall. I don't think it ever really was uh, years ago and it is certainly not today. What we're seeing in Pennsylvania now uh, is definitely some major backlash against this current president and his administration. We saw that in 2018 during the blue wave. Certainly going to benefit uh, the Democratic Party uh, in November, but beyond 2020, I would expect Pennsylvania to actually drift more to the right in future elections, and I'll tell you why. Pennsylvania has grown by less than 1% over the last 10 years, which is a pretty, pretty slow rate compared to other states that are uh, uh, tending to become more Democrat moving forward, like Nevada, uh, Arizona and Texas. This basically means that cities aren't growing as much. The urban population is not increasing at the rate that it needs to be for the state to uh, um, to uh, drift, to be considered a more safe democratic state. So even though we've projected uh, Joe Biden to carry the state somewhat comfortably this year, I, uh, it's, it's not becoming more democrat, not in the long run. A lot of rural Pennsylvanians, I, I imagine, felt like the Obama administration did not deliver for them. And that was a lot, account, accounted for a lot of the uh, Obama to Trump voters, I suppose, if they, if they exist. And if the Republican Party gets its act together after 2020, I expect uh, those people to be a pretty reliable voting block for the Republican Party moving forward. That just about does it for our latest episode of Elections by Numbers. I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in today. If you like what you saw, please hit the subscribe button to get updates on new content as it becomes available. I upload videos every Monday and Thursday. I'm also on Twitter and I update that account with which state I'm covering next ahead of the scheduled release date. So if you want to stay ahead of the curve, please give me a follow on Twitter and that link is in the description. Thanks again for watching. Thank you for voting. See you next time.